What separates a good anime from a great anime? Why do some anime stick with us long after we've watched it? Welcome to The Workshop. I'm Emily. And I'm Chris. And in this podcast, we discuss and deconstruct storytelling elements in some of our favorite animes. Today in The Workshop, we will be discussing Season 1 of Fire Force, which ran from July to December of 2019, and Season 2 has been given a July 2020 premiere, so we'll be looking forward to that soon. And as always, we'll warn you that our main discussion after we give our first impressions will be full of spoilers for Season 1, so make sure you go check it out before listening on. So Fire Force recounts the adventures of Shinra Kusakabe, who is a young pyrokinetic who enlists as a rookie fire soldier with the Special Fire Force Company 8. They live in a world where humans are spontaneously combusting into flames to become beings known as infernals, and it's the job of fire soldiers to protect civilians and to contain these infernals. However, Company 8 in particular engages in their own covert mission to investigate the other seven companies for potential corruption within their ranks. Meanwhile, Shinra learns some unsettling truths about his own past and about the house fire that took the lives of his mom and his baby brother 12 years ago. So, I mean, that's a highly interesting premise, (laughs) if anything. Yeah, it's a good premise. It's when you say it like that, it sounds like so condensed, like there's so many things happening, but it's just a typical like shonen anime setup, I would say. That is true. When I was, when I was kind of like, wording together the summary i was like oh my gosh so many things yeah happen in it this doesn't series. sound as confusing as it sounds when we put it in like a paragraph yes. like that yes yeah but for let's go into our first impressions first. yes so right off the bat like first episode in my literally literally my first point in my notes scenery animation action scenes just everything mm-hmm. animation wise looks so so good, good. <laughs> it's so beautiful um the character designs world building the character designs and like their clothing i love i love in particular the fact that they wear these like really bulky firefighting uniforms yeah i think it mm-hmm. like it's so cute and you you often mm-hmm. see shonen um anime characters and protagonists wearing like these very impractical things but oh my god just to look cool yeah (laughs) um so i like how the firefighting uniforms limit limits their like mobility a lot but it's so cute i love it and then also i think that this show does a lot with their sound design as well Mm -hmm. um You'll see that in a lot of their humorous moments and dramatic moments as well, not just humorous ones. They'll do a lot of sudden transition cuts um, paired with like a very grating, jarring sound if it's supposed to be a dramatic scene or just like a very frank, like uh, these frank sound effects for the more comedic ones, Mm -hmm. which I I thought was really cute. So overall, my first impression was that this anime was very, very beautiful. Um, they mm-hmm. put a lot of emphasis on their aesthetics, which is great. Mm-hmm. It makes me very <laughs> interested in seeing um, like where they plan on taking like the next steps in terms of animation and aesthetic. Right. But that being said, I do think that this story and this series has a problem with their pacing and their uh their writing Mm -hmm. which is of Mm -hmm. course what we are largely concerned about (laughs) um i will say just to be very honest and straight up that up until like episode 10 or 11 i wasn't really into it Mm. i thought that if i hadn't been watching this episode or watching this series for our podcast i don't know if fire force would have necessarily been an anime that i ha- would have stuck with right yeah and gone to the end but i'm glad i did because mm. i do think that the writing gets way better towards the end and i i wouldn't say it wraps up very nicely because I, the ending also has its own issues mm-hmm. but just the beginning and the pacing of like the setup and exposition i thought was a little bit lacking so that's that was my first impression that's actually really interesting cuz i felt like I felt the opposite. I was more into the show for the first half. And then when I was getting to the second half, I was like, eh. Right. But I actually felt like I was, I I enjoyed and I was excited for the premise setup and the, you know, like what the, how the mysteries were going to unfold. And then mm-hmm. when 
the mysteries started unfolding or not unfolding, I was kind of yeah. like disappointed with the execution. So it was more like I was excited for the the groundwork and the the expectations that the writer was setting up. But then when things actually started unfolding, I was disappointed with the actual writing. So, okay, yeah, we'll go into that later. That's um, interesting. Yeah. This is the first time we had con- completely conflicting yeah. opinions. But anyways, just to like go over my first impressions, yeah. I guess I have to preface it by talking first about how much I love Atsushi Okubo, who's the mangaka for yeah. Fire Force. And I just love him as an artist and his style and specifically... I love his previous work, Soul Eater, which was like a mid thousands anime and manga. Soul Eater, yeah, and Soul, I love Eater. Soul Eater. Soul Eater was honestly, <laughs> it was honestly one of my favorite anime when I was younger, and so I was watching a little bit of the first episode, and I think it's still one of the most like visually unique and interesting anime out there. But anyways, I bring that up because I feel like. I, my love for Soul Eater kind of colored my viewing experience of Fire Force mm-hmm. in a good way. Like I went in with really high expectations and I was pleasantly surprised that I still enjoyed the show on a surface level. Um, I think writing wise, the main characters are super likable and they're distinct and they're interesting and like visually the art style is amazing. I think it's undeniable, like you said, that the strongest part of the show is the animation. <laughs> it's a beautifully animated show. I could literally feel the serotonin in my brain like <laughs> well what, what what's the scientific I don't know what the science is behind that Serotonin, serotonin dopamine yeah I could just feel it like coursing through my body watching these animations <laughs> um it's just really top tier and I think the show really really values yeah. spectacle and making things just look really oh cool my gosh. and I think yes. I will also say before we start digging in on the writing that making things look cool for a battle show in anime is a huge Part. And I just want to say, like, oh, yeah. hats off to them for doing that because, like, even though I am a grown adult, I still value anime looking mm-hmm. really, really, really mm-hmm. cool. And so the animation studio, David Production, I am also going to mention them in my first impressions because when I started watching the show, I was like, this feels so different than a typical shonen anime in terms of the editing and like the direction and the framing of shots. A lot of okay. their animators come from Shaft animation. A lot of Shaft's roster is is basic, has little to no shonen, I would say. So for them to kind of, for the ex-employees of Shaft to kind of come in and do a show like Fire Force. <laughs> Let's do Fire Force. Yeah, you would think. <laughs> All <it> would, battle <laughs> scenes. <laughs> you would think it would be a disadvantage. But I honestly feel like they gave the animation yeah they definitely I could feel bits and pieces of their very distinct animation style I think they gave the animation a certain uniqueness um and it's one of my favorite parts about the show and I read some some criticisms from people who didn't like the editing or the framing of certain shots um they found Hmm. it weird or awkward but to me those were like the stylistic cinematography choices that I really really liked yeah the writing fell flat in certain places like the exposition and the villain mm-hmm. writing. Um, so we'll go into that. But I would say yes. overall, if you're like a solid shonen anime fan, I would say you would probably enjoy this. Okay, awesome. Let's get straight into the writing then. So we split this entire series up into three main sections Mm -hmm. and then within those segments we have um lesser arcs to go through so first we've got the the setup of the premise which is episodes one to three and then we've got the hibana arc where they're investigating the fifth division and then we've got the rekka arc which uh in which they're investigating the first division did you have anything that stood out to you within the setup of the premise or anything i sort of look at the first three episodes as a bit of a contained section um because when i when I watch like any show for the first time, like a completely new show, I tend to give it a three episode rule. So I tend to judge Hmm. like how well can this show tell me what it's about and make me want to keep watching within those first three episodes. I really liked the first three episodes in the way that, you know, they set up the premise like Shinra is, um, he joins the force. You can tell that he kind of has, there's something, you know, special about him because he's really strong, really just focusing on meeting that main cast of characters. Who are they? What's their relationship with each other? And then, yeah. And then episode three, we get a little tease of um, what the antagonistic 
uh, one of the antagonistic forces of the show could be. We get a little bit of mystery as to Shinra's character. Um, and then you get the the sort of truth bomb at the end of episode three, which is that Company 8 isn't just another fire force. Like they're here to mm. actually investigate corruption within the fire right. force division and you also kind of tease this idea of like we're trying to figure out what infern like what is actually causing infernals so you get all of that in the first three episodes and to me it was a great setup um i think it was enough to make me want to keep watching and i think it, it really sort of solidifies the foundation of the show <laughs> um the writing <laughs> afterwards is kind of where it the pacing, like you said, starts to get a little bit weird to me and the exposition doesn't, it, it falls flat, I feel like, going forward. Mm. Um, so, yeah, but those were kind of my thoughts on the first three episodes. I thought they were solid. I thought they were solid. I know, for me, like, I kind of felt like there was a wall that was hit in terms of writing, even right off the bat in the first three episodes as well. I was kind of confused that they were will so willing to put the rookie straight into the heat of the job and of the right. moment and yeah. of the fires right away because I don't know for me I was kind of expecting some kind of orientation or a training arc or something right, I, didn't, right, right. I didn't really know yeah. but I, I that kind of caught me off guard the second thing is um I felt like the pacing showed itself here when it's it's Shinra and Arthur's first job mm -hmm. uh and Obi explains to the boys specifically the importance of hiding your weapons from the public eye. You know, that's right. very logical and reasonable. Yeah. And then the boys like overtly ignore the warning. Yeah. And, <laughs> and they just like pull their guns out or pull their swords out, whatever. Uh -huh. And I felt that was like a very convenient way for the writer to serve as an opportunity for the captain to take them aside and explain um, over a heartfelt montage and over very emotional music why it's important to, you know, respect the people who are left behind by the Infernals. I mean, the message yeah. is great mm -hmm. and the moment is very beautiful, but I, I kept on feeling as though it were very artificial and very deliberately f f like set up to like feel that way. Like just too heavy handed slash melodramatic? Melodramatic, yeah, okay. that's a good way of putting it. Mm -hmm. Um, and all of it, all too sudden. This show strives to be, strives to show these like very emotional and cathartic moments without really allowing us a believable build up for well, how did they get there? Right. I can see why it comes across as melodramatic because I think you know typically with these like shown in anime or I guess just across media, like when you. Mm are given an emotional moment or a moment where, you know, the writer is really trying to like hammer in some themes or they're really trying to, you know, touch upon a tender moment. And so the tender moment mm -hmm. that we're talking here is sort of this whole idea of, you know, the job that we're doing as Fire Force soldiers, it's a sad job. Exactly. And so, yeah. And so I think that theme within itself is actually something that I really enjoyed. Um, but mm -hmm. I do see why or how it can come across as melodramatic because Obi just kind of says it in like yeah. uh, in, in a speech. And I think usually, you know, typically we feel like those moments have to be earned. And that's what creates melodrama yes. is when you don't yes. feel like an emotional moment is earned. And so I think a lot of exposition in this show does come like it does come through people just saying it. And I have mm -hmm. I have other instances in the show where it bothers me. Um, I would say that this particular moment didn't bother me. Um, the only thing I will say to maybe why he chose to do that other than just lazy writing could be, and this could actually go into pacing problems, is that he just wanted to kind of hammer in the the humanness of the job mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. when we meet um, sort of the more corrupt characters in the Fire Force who are using Infernals as like research or who are creating Infernals, right. um, it, it sort of makes it seem a lot more sinister. All right. So going into the next arc mini arc, I guess, mm -hmm. is the Hibana arc, Investigation of the Fifth Division. Um, that's going to be the episodes between episodes four and six. So essentially, they uh, arrive at Company 5 to, uh, and there's like a kerfluffle that happens. Mm -hmm. So I was really happy that I finally got to see some some action-packed drama. Right. Um, 
I will say that the battle in per- the battle in particular in this arc was hmm the one it was satisfying Shinra versus Captain Hibana Shinra right? versus Hibana and yeah. then also I think Arthur had his little mini battle as well I and then some so. of the others did as well but yeah. the, the most prominent one is Shinra versus Hibana yeah. I will say that it was it was very satisfying mm-hmm. but it was also a little bit lackluster for me and I'll say why yeah. um Personally, I I enjoy battles that have a lot of intelligence and like strategy involved. Right. And I tend to dislike battles where the protag just seems to win because of sheer willpower alone. Mm. Or like determination. That's because a lot of shonen. I, I know, I know. And yeah, I, maybe no, it's I know because Maybe because it's, I'm just tired of it. Like it's, it's so overdone, I think. Um, so that I really, appre- and, and that's why I say like, I think it was satisfying. It doesn't mm. mean it was bad. Yeah. Um, but it, it didn't exceed my expectations, right. I guess you can say. Yeah. Right? It's just to your point about <laughs> pro tags, like winning yeah. battles based on, yeah, just because they believe so much. Like, yeah, <laughs> I think, I think there's a time and a place. I think okay. not all battles have to be these like amazing feats mm-hmm. of intelligence. I think those should be reserved for the battles that, you know, thematically and plot wise really matter. Um, I would say I agree with you, though, that I think Shinra versus Hibana could have been a little bit more interesting because I feel like my whole issue with this sort of Hibana arc was they really sort of built up Hibana to be this extremely villainous character like she is a Mm -hmm. she's a captain of company five um and she used to be uh close with iris who is the sister of company eight she you know decided to kind of like reject religion and she wanted to rise to power yeah and so they really sort of built her up to be this villain who is like super strong and within the span of like these three episodes she goes from like being extremely villainous to just being like yeah, I'm just going to join Company 8 and, like, help them invest – or not join them, but, like, yeah, Company 5 right. is going to help Company 8 investigate corruption. And I was like, what is her <laughs> reasoning for flipping sides? She has this conversation with Obi, Captain Obi, where she basically says, like, oh, you know, fighting Shinra helped her remember, like, why she joined this fight. And, like, she specifically right. uses the words, like, you know, he reminded me of this, like, tenderness of justice. So basically – you know, encountering Shinra made her kind of reevaluate her values, which is fine. I think that point alone is fine. I just felt like it happened so fast and there was, <laughs> there just wasn't enough clarity. Like I wasn't mm-hmm. convinced, you know, during that fight that like she would flip just like that. And I don't know where she sort of had this instance during her fight with Shinra where she's like, like really changing her her frame of mind. We could attribute that to bad writing and pacing as well um but that doesn't mean like i dislike hibana's Mm -mm. character in any way right i think that yeah 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 she's fine i think her backstory is is a good driving force for her Mm -hmm. and i do i do like that they made her a scientist because yeah that's always fine i really like the inclusion (laughs) of of like scientific concepts in their Mm -hmm. powers Okay, so that is our Hibana arc. And then we move from there into episode seven to nine, which is the investigation of the first division. Yeah. So it's Hibana. When Hibana decides to join Company 8, so to speak, she has intelligence um, information that she shares with Captain Obi. Um, and mm-hmm. she's like, yeah, they, they're they using bugs to create infernals. I honestly don't feel like she <laughs> she didn't have to have this whole like exposition reveal in just in in literally just a conversation with Ovi like that's the kind of reveal that you could have done in a more interesting way because that's that Mm -hmm. contributes to the mystery writing of the show and just to kind of have Hibana be like yeah they're making infernals with bugs (laughs) and yeah that's it So Mm -hmm. a little disappointed there, but yeah. Fire Force is very much, I wouldn't say driven solely, but driven in a large part by the mystery aspect. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I really like that. I think mystery is like a very interesting thing to add, but only when it's done well. I think that if a mystery isn't 
um, unraveled slowly and with very nuanced like ways to drop hints where the hints instead of just like the hints being Mm -hmm. conveniently given to them yeah I think that that is a large part of why the first half of the show was ruined for me because the first half of the show was their opportunity to you know Um, stretch out this mystery in me yeah I had the same issues like to me like that's what I considered like just poor exposition like lore exposition Mm -hmm. um and I think the reason that I was like I noticed it throughout the entire show but I think the reason that I was like more interested in the first part of the show was because I was still I felt like the the character writing of of the main cast of characters was and in the world and everything was still interesting enough for me to sort of you know compel me to keep watching and like I was still sort of interested in learning about the world but Mm -hmm. then when you actually get to the latter half of the show and you just sort of realize like what has the information like the information that I got in the first half of the show hasn't led me to anything (laughs) so that's why at the end I was just like uh what is this like what am I still watching (laughs) but I also want to say though and this is slightly off topic like my whole thing is I think every I think every story is a mystery like period like and like it doesn't matter it doesn't okay. matter what the mystery is like in every story you are withholding information and w- what the plot should be like what makes an interesting plot is how the writer chooses to show that information so that when the writer or sorry when the viewer or whatever gets to the end of the story the viewer should feel like they were on the path to the same conclusions if that makes sense right and I think where the show sort of falls flat is it sort of gives you all this information here and there (laughs) but nothing really feels like the viewer was was kind of invested in that story like I I didn't Mm -hmm. feel like I could put any anything together to get to the revelations that we get to Mm -hmm. at the end but yeah that's just sort of my whole thing about like where the lore starts getting weird (laughs) and the the Rekka arc kind of goes into more of I guess we meet the next we get a teaser into the next like antagonistic force of the show I think this was probably my least favorite arc Mm -hmm. out of the entire series um I mean I think the lieutenant priests of the company one were very interesting yeah um they had very interesting powers interesting quirks and names but then I just like Rekka as a as a villain and as a character not only is he detestable he's just Mm -hmm. a terrible guy right but it didn't feel like I got anything out of this battle either other than like it didn't uh, other than an introduction to the main antagonist mm-hmm. which I, which is fine yeah um but it didn't feel like Shinra learned anything right it didn't feel like Rekka learned anything mm-hmm, <laughs> like mm-hmm, it, it didn't mm-hmm. feel like anything new was revealed either and so not only was the mystery arc in this arc in particular heavy-handed and very convenient but I it it wasn't re- redeemed either with the final battle of this yeah. arc, right? I I agree. I think that this was a very surface level fight. Um, I think Rekka, he's only here for like three episodes, and I honestly feel like yeah. he just serves to be an introduction into uh, the Evangelist and the white clad mm-hmm. knights who are the followers of the Evangelist. Um, they are like the other big villain force in the show. And it's still unclear as to like what the evangelist is at this point in the story, which is fine. It's fine to like not know who the characters are yet because we've just met them. But I just feel like every fight or every like big scene should be serving, serving a purpose on multiple levels. And I think the reason that it falls flat is because this the fight only really serves the plot on one level, which is to introduce the evangelist as a villain but like there should be more movement for the characters here but it just kind of Mm -hmm. feels like like it was just one plot thread (laughs) being advanced which I just think is kind of inefficient writing uh we get some more time with Tamaki's character yeah (laughs) um so let's talk about Tamaki for a second here Tamaki is a rookie soldier at the first division um and she 
admires Rekka. Like it's kind mm-hmm. of her whole character introduction is like she loves Rekka. She admires him. Obviously, like she kind of blindly worships him. Before Shinra gets there to rescue her, she doesn't even get to fight him at all. <laughs> and she's a fire soldier and you're telling me that she can't even get one hit in i was i was so upset because yeah it's it, so it, weird. it looked like he had like broken all her bones yes right yeah and then kind of like cast her aside but then later on in like the next episode or something she's like carrying kids on her back yeah it's like what what consistency <laughs> i was like huh <laughs> that's some just weird anime like yeah ridiculousness <laughs> but i i just think yes. that first of all the scene the, the it's not a full scene but watching Rekka kind of like beat her up is very difficult to watch and i think i was really disappointed that tamaki couldn't even fight back like to me there was no reason for her to not be able to at mm-hmm. least get a couple of hits in and i mean I maybe agree. you could justify it by saying like she was in shock and blah blah, blah. her bones are broken her bones are broken now. <laughs> hmm. i have a real problem with tamaki's character supposedly being portrayed as a fighter yes and actually being pretty useless okay so at this point we're like almost 10 episodes in yeah right? mm-hmm. i would say that's quite a significant portion of the yeah. season if there's only going to be 24 episodes to this season yeah so up until now we've gotten too many boss battles mm-hmm. and none of them for me at least have been particularly they've been both a little bit lackluster mm-hmm. and then we get this tertiary villain the joker right i i just feel very frustrated every time the joker appears because even though i think that he's a cool character it makes me very frustrated whenever he says things like oh you are so resilient so here's a reward for being uh (laughs) for being able to smile here is a tidbit about your past right right, which i just think it made me this like the show even more because it was like, can we please see Shinra develop as a character? Like, uh-huh. I haven't seen him go through a training arc. I haven't seen him go through any kind of emotional growth or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, he d- he doesn't even like like take I, I, the most growth that he's gotten in terms of battling would be the realization that oh I can use the space around me to go faster and like, Yay. get more mobility yeah. <laughs> okay here are my thoughts I think okay, yes. <laughs> I think yes. yeah I agree with your point about the, when the Joker just kind of drops in mm-hmm. to just kind of give these little tidbits of information Mm-hmm. When that first started happening, I was also kind of like Ugh, about it because it was like, that's just too convenient for like, it's just convenient exposition. I do think that is like a weak part about the Joker's character. I do. The reason that I think that uh, I guess I don't really have a lot of thoughts on him, but the reason that I'm OK with him okay. now um, in comparison to, for example, like the evangelist in terms of the other villains is because mm-hmm. yeah. he kind of drops in and he has this confrontation with um, the white clad and specifically Sho, um, who is the leader of the white clad knights. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, it sort of implies or it sort of shows that the Joker isn't really aligned with them. So there's this yeah. overarching mystery of like what his goals actually are and what his intentions actually are. And so I think it's okay for that to be sort of there because seeing that, I don't actually have any kind of, yeah, I don't have any strong feelings about him because it's like, okay, if he's not aligned with the evangelist, then he has another character motivation. And maybe that will be a little bit more interesting. Maybe that will add to the plot at a later point in the show. Mm -hmm. So I'm withholding judgment on him. All right, Kristen, I have an interesting proposition. Yes. So I actually have this labeled as under one of my missed opportunities examples. Um, So there were two parts in this anime where I felt like they could have steered the story in a different direction that mm. would have been very interesting. interesting. So the first, yes, so the first scene that stood out to me was when they went on their, this has taken it back to like the first few episodes, when they go on their first job mm-hmm. and um, they they are speaking to this girl whose father turned into an infernal. Yeah. So after they put her father to rest, she's kind of like sitting on the ground and Obi offers her a couple of words of consolation uh-huh. but in my head i i couldn't help but think think like okay so is she homeless now like oh are, yeah do you do you <laughs> like do you only take care of 
as, as the fire force, do you only are you only responsible for the flashy battling uh-huh. and the taking out and putting to rest of the infernal? Yeah. On a related note as well, another episode that stood out to me also towards the beginning um, was when there was this this guy who was like very he was a firefighter I think mm-hmm. and but he was like a very corrupt man and he turns it into into an infernal right um, and then but before he does he's brought into court. Okay, and yeah. I think that I don't remember clearly what happens in court, but I think that there was some kind of like um, like bias towards him because he was so confident that he would get away with his crimes because he was in the fire department. Mm. And I swear to you that I I thought of this point before all, before all, all the of protests. these movements yeah. started happening. But regardless, I think that like how interesting would it have been if Fire Force had taken their plot line and direction in a way where they touched on topics like police brutality Mm -hmm. or bias towards or um, comfort that people in those positions might feel because they are in public service occupations that that do weld some sort of authority, right? Yeah. I don't know. I just felt like those would have been great opportunities that the show could have at least touched upon a little bit, maybe, uh, to make things more interesting, right? Right. I think, here's what I think. Um, yes. This is just a proposition. Yeah. Looking at the anime and saying, I would have been a lot more interested in if the show explored a purely, just like, purely human and sort of government mm. corruption and systemic issues or societal political issues a type Mm. of story I think especially right now I think it's it's important for our media and our attention to be focused on and reflect societal issues um Mm -hmm. this is a shonen anime though and I think shonen yeah and I think anime in general is just they're just always so inclined to have some kind of big bad which is fine which is fine but only if it's interesting i think <laughs> oh yeah yeah i think the show like you said missed opportunities definitely could have delved into the issue of accountability of law enforcement a lot more mm-hmm. and the corruption of law enforcement a lot more because we say it a lot like or the show even says like well, we're here to investigate the corruption in the other fire force departments but i just kind of wish that we could have seen more instances of the humans being affected by that corruption because mm. we're just supposed to assume like oh, okay so the fire force has some hand in in the infernals And so, yeah, we don't really see the direct impact that that has on the public. And we don't really even see, like, what is the public perception of law enforcement in this? We do get a taste of it. We get bits and pieces of it. I remember there was was one episode where, like, one of their mascots got thrown into a tree because some, like, some people were saying they had a very negative perception of the fire force. Right. But they never, like, go on to expand on that. Okay, so the next arc is the Asakusa arc, which is kind of like this... I would call it a village. Is that what we would yeah. call it? <laughs> I mean, it's a district. Um, <laughs> I think all of these... Yeah. They're, all, they're real districts, like, in, districts, in Tokyo. Districts, yes. Um, yes. And so, specifically, this district of Asakusa is supposed to be, like, a remnant of traditional Japan. And they, the people within this small district don't follow the same god or any of the... Yeah any of the beliefs or the structure of like the rest of Tokyo. They don't really follow the empire and they don't believe in like the holy god of Saul or whatever it is. When they kind of enter Asakusa and we sort of meet um, Captain or Benimaru, he, there's kind of this like infernal attack that happens within Asakusa. And so the, the process and the sort of rites and traditions of like putting down this infernal is very different than how we see um, company yeah. eight putting down their the infernals or dealing with the infernals. I would say this arc was a turning point for me. You know everything you said about the the uh, the world building here, but also I think Benny's character, for me at least, was the first character that stood out as being very honest and genuine. Mm-hmm. Um, because he he just comes across as a guy who like he's chill but he like doesn't know what he's doing but he's still the captain yeah and i was like wow relatable not relatable but like yeah. relatable and yeah i don't know what i'm doing either mm-hmm. um so i really like that about benny's character in that 
he's he just seems he's he seems like a more regular human just trying to get by even though he's supposedly like the mightiest fire soldier mm-hmm. in this entire empire mm-hmm. it was like a refreshingly comedic right comedic moment he's just very i think like a lot of the people in the district he's very crass yeah. you can definitely tell like they don't really want to be like they don't believe in this kind of institution that they're mm-hmm. serving so it gives them a very unique kind of outlook on on life. But also because up until this point, we've always just been investigating companies. We've never gotten a chance to like breathe and slow down like we do in the seventh division where it's like, OK, like we can trust everyone here and we can say that like mm-hmm. um, we're not we're not suspicious of you. We're here to learn. And yeah. I think that a lot of the characters from Company 8 do get to learn more about themselves and about the world mm-hmm. during this arc, which which is why I found it so refreshing. Yeah. The reason that I think the Asakusa arc works so well is because we're advancing sort of multiple plot and character things at the same time. Um, So on a world building level, we get to see the contrast between Asakusa and the rest of Tokyo. We also get to see um, the difference in like leadership. And then we Mm -hmm. get to see, and then we get a little bit of the evangelist coming in. And so I think the evangelist fights are a little bit more interesting with the backdrop of Asakusa. They do start to get more interesting. Yeah. Yes. So I think that's what makes they it. They start using their brains more, which I love. Mm. So yeah, I don't know. I thought it was, that was a good arc. I very much enjoyed the next arc as well. Our yeah, Vulcan arc. The good arc as so, well. So yes, another good arc. Yes. Let's, let's Not a perfect keep, arc. Keep a coming. Not a Not perfect, perfect <laughs> arc, but uh is it, is Not it, a good it, one. The reason, okay, the reason it works though is like Asakusa was fun because we got to meet like Benny, and this yeah. arc is fun because we get to meet Vulcan. I feel like, like it's very, mm-hmm. it's very much about the characters. When you start looking at the <laughs> lore, you're kind of like, huh? So, essentially, Company realizes that they're in desperate need of an engineer. Yeah. So, because his reputation precedes him, they go after this guy named Vulcan, um, and he's also basically like the Winry Rock Bell of this entire show mm-hmm. because. We love engineers. We yes. love their steampunk aesthetic. <laughs> and we love wrenches. We okay? love Let wrenches. Let me just say that if you are an engineer and you do not have a collection of wrenches, what are you, what are you can even you doing? Even call you? <laughs> Leave my anime. Exactly. So um, we get to Vulcan's wink wink workshop. Oh, God. <laughs> wink wink. Yep. This arc got to me because Dr. Giovanni's character writing as a villain i felt was very very strong he's very frightening and i think it comes from a combination of being very cool-headed but also very powerful and even if you just look at his like aesthetic so he he wears a bird mask right which is what they they used to wear in like the 17th century for like plague doctors Mm -hmm. so it was very much so a symbol of death that was very very frightening for patients with the bubonic plague Mm -hmm. i know he does have limbs but the limbs that he uses to battle with are are like these detachable robotic limbs right and so the mask in combination with the limbs makes him feel less not less than but something other than human right there was this one part that he that was very very frightening to me he um when he gets like uh, frustrated or heated in the moment Mm -hmm. he starts repeating his words and i think that the use of rhythm in this arc is very powerful because first you see Vulcan at work and you it's revealed that he's very rhythmic when he works mm, right yeah and that rhythm is supposed to be very comforting and familiar but then you contrast that to how rhythm is used to portray Dr. Giovanni and the way that he's like repeating his words and it's very it's very frightening yeah <laughs> that's the only really word that I can put I kind of like geeked out over his character writing. I think also that the reason that Giovanni stands out as a more interesting and layered villain or like sinister Mm. force within the show is because it's also because like, you know, he isn't just, he isn't like the supernatural force. And he, he also learned that he, um, he was actually an engineer that apprenticed under Vulcan's dad, I think, or grand mm-hmm. grandfather. Or grandfather. Yeah. yeah. So he has this like, there's like an emotional tie there. Like, you know, it's 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 that layer of like he's physically dangerous, but also um like mentally and emotionally he will mess with you as well. And so mm-hmm. I think that's what we mean when we say 
it's more interesting to have villains who are really like layered in their in their motivations but also Mm -hmm. when when their personal motivations gives more a a more direct um, effect on the characters lives like when there's not enough information for people to understand like what are the forces that are actually at play here it it just makes it a lot less engaging just touching back on like the idea of human issues Mm -hmm. right like I think that they do a good job of portraying like family I think would be a very yeah prominent topic that they explore because Lisa was very much even though planted they have this like image of a family and they're all sitting around the dinner table in my notes it says tell me how this um tell me how this family is able to persuade me in like one episode to believe that (laughs) they're an actual family versus company eight and over which they had to do over like a number of episodes right so I, I I did also very much personally like the the portrayal of family. I, I, I think like company eight and like this family, it's like it's two very different things. Um, mm-hmm. And I think both are written pretty well. And I think yeah. the reason that it works, especially with Vulcan's character, is family is sort of this constant thing for him because he has a lot of respect for his his grandfather and his father first of all the family made the amaterasu which is like the the main energy source of the world and then he knows that his his forefathers were killed over it so he he has that loss of family and then he has this illusion of a family that comes to him through you and lisa and then finds out that you know that that sense of family is essentially betrayed and it shatters and then i kind of liked that the arc ends with him looking out at the at the dinner table and he's just kind of seeing this family dynamic that Company 8 has. And they're really like, you know, with the bickering, with the laughing, with the conversation, with Hinoa in the kitchen making making their food. Like he's sort of looking out at this scene and he sort of realizes like this is a very genuine group of people. And I also feel, I think that Vulcan's recruitment feels very earned because, you know, he's he's, he's (laughs) set up to feel like he's, he's impossible to recruit but then all of this happens over the course of like not just one episode but like three to four which is a lot for Mm. this show to take that time to spend on his character um and then by the end of it when he decides to join it feels like it makes sense so i feel like Mm. it was one of the better instances of of character writing here i was very happy with these two arcs Mm -hmm. asakusa and um the vulcan Vulcan arc arc. okay so episode 18 is a training episode it's not a training arc traditionally in shonen anime we get a training episode earlier in the series like at this point like you know we're we're more than halfway through season one i personally didn't have an issue with its placement Um, I thought that it was a good breather before going right into the finale arc. And I think the reason that it feels like the rookies are sort of unjustly powerful is because when we see them, they've already joined the Fire Force, whereas a typical shonen might have started following them while they were in the academy. But the show chooses to start when they've already like started the job. And yeah, so it's I think that's kind of why it feels like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think it was good to kind of just sort of have some time to go into, you know, like the the deeper techniques of how like fighting works in this show. And Shinra mm-hmm. learns some important stuff about how to control his flames from Benny. And it was very, to me, it was actually very reminiscent of Naruto. So it's nothing like groundbreaking. What I do like about this episode, though, is that we have Victor come into the training session. To me, this creates an undercurrent of tension because at this point in the show, we don't know what Victor's intentions are. But then I feel like they didn't really do anything with Victor's character after that. Just since the, since the last time we talked about the placement of the training arc, I was doing a little bit more thinking. Mm-hmm. And I think that I've come to appreciate more the placement of this particular episode in the series. I liked that they were training under Benny Mm -hmm. and I feel like I wouldn't have liked it this much if we didn't get to know Benny's character first. So I appreciate it coming after. And yeah, I completely agree with all your points. I think the only reason why I felt like it could have come earlier was because I was just so desperately looking for a reason to um, believe in the growth of our protagonists right. because I never felt like they learned anything emotionally or strategically during any of their mm-hmm. earlier battles. 
so it's not that the it's I have a problem with the placement of the episode, but more so all those problems that I had mentioned before just made this one felt like, okay, finally I'm getting what I want. <laughs> yeah, getting what we want. Now, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I, yeah, I do think exactly. that like in terms of like the emotional development of the characters, like it, it it is definitely lacking. And I don't think that it has to manifest in necessarily in like a tr- in like training or in them improving their abilities. Mm-hmm. But because it's a shonen anime, like you kind of expect them to have emotional development through yeah. training. Um, and then this is really the catalyst and the prep for us to go into our final segment. Yes. Uh, episodes 19 to the to the end, 24. Company 8 basically realizes that if they want to go on the offensive against this enemy, then they have to kind of seek their base out in the nether, which is like a very unclean place yeah. where soul or like their equivalent of God doesn't reach because it's like underground and it's closer to hell Mm -hmm. but actually it's just the abandoned subway system under tokyo okay fun fact when (laughs) victor is like showing their um the map for like Mm -hmm. where the the enemy base is located Mm -hmm. he points to this particular station called yotsuya station Mm -hmm. now i don't know if you already know this um, and for any Kimi no Nawa fans out there oh. <laughs> who haven't seen it, um, <laughs> Yotsuya Station is where Taki and Okudera Senpai go on their first date. Oh my gosh, really? That's so interesting. That is some like niche <laughs> knowledge that you have there. <laughs> I know this because I like in the middle of the, of watching the series in preparation for the pod, I watched Your Name Again. Mm. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> That's so interesting. So, <laughs> wow. <laughs> anyway, some fun okay. facts for you there. <laughs> okay. So, when the team arrives underground, uh-huh. they're almost immediately split up, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and here's where I'll say that I liked this part of the arc. I mean, it's pretty characteristic of shonen anime to split up their team at some point and kind of pair them up with different villains. What determines whether this part of the arc fails or doesn't or succeeds Mm -hmm. is what kind of pairings you have. And I do like the pairings that they get matched up with. So the first one that comes to mind for me is the Tamaki and Iris versus Assault the Slaughterer Mm -hmm. pairing. Yes. Um, First of all, I'm not a big fan of Tamaki's character, but I was actually laughing out loud when Iris was like trying to tell the difference between the real and the fake Tamaki. Oh yeah. (laughs) Um, Even though the fake one had like a man's voice. Um, And I will say that I like how they keep their characters consistent. Mm -hmm. For example, Maki is consistently strong and shows that until the very end. Mm -hmm. While Tamaki in contrast is very consistently weak. And I think that if uh, like in comparison mm-hmm. and I think that if they had taken this battle as a time for her to shine and for her to say you know I am a fighter I can do this yeah which is very much so what she says is part of her rhetoric. yeah but she doesn't she doesn't show it and that's just consistent with what she's been the whole time yeah so so I'm I was happy and relieved that they didn't all of a sudden give her a power up mm. to um to defeat this guy and so that's why i think the quote-unquote unconventional defeat of assault Mm. at the hands of like iris and tamaki were it works Mm -hmm. and it was actually pretty funny and pretty endearing yeah i agree and i do like that Mm -hmm. you know in a flashback we take the time to acknowledge that um tamaki she she's aware of her weakness or that she's she's not on par with the other soldiers and her abilities and so she does kind of want to prove herself but she doesn't like it's not like it's out of character the fight like the actual nature Mm -hmm. of the fight it still sort of fits within within her character let's talk about giovanni a little bit obi and vulcan come across giovanni and lisa again right and i know that i had this whole spiel about giovanni being a great villain i still think he is I do. I I did also like this battle. I liked most of the battles in this arc. Yeah. Um. There's something about the use of technology, especially with Vulcan's involvement, mm-hmm. that renders there to be always a little bit of like intellect involved. Because you have to think of like very clever ways to use your technology yeah. and the machinery that you have on hand to almost like outwit the opponent. Mm-hmm. So the nature of the fight, I've really liked as well. 
I don't know. I felt like you had a lot to say about the evangelist up until this point, and I'm just mm. interested in knowing, like, okay, yeah, what you think about <laughs> this main the main character? Because I think we said that like this show doesn't have very good villain writing in general. So just to talk about the evangelist and I guess just the villain writing. I've said it multiple yeah. times already, but I think that, and this probably ties into why I didn't enjoy the latter half of the show as much, or, you know, I still enjoyed it because it was like pretty and like it, you know, I cared about the characters enough mm. to want to know what happened. Um, but the actual mystery behind like what the evangelist is and everything is just kind of weak because you can kind of already tell that, okay, the evangelist is probably some sort of like evil supernatural being. And I don't think by the end of it, we really learned anything interesting about, you know, why I should care about what the villain wants. Because I think the reveal at the end is that, you know, the evangelist wants to basically restart another apocalypse. And for some reason, it needs the um the Adela burst which is this like special power that Shinra has and that his brother Sho has in order to do that and they are creating infernals in order to restart the apocalypse first of all yeah. am I just dumb but like what does that mean and <laughs> second of all like you're trying to restart the apocalypse and for, for what, what? <laughs> <laughs> like this goes I just stole through... Chris's tagline but <laughs> yeah it's like I don't know what the goal is here Okay, this is what I'm going to say. This is supposed to be some kind of revelation or a plot twist or, or something. And this is why it doesn't mm. work because plot twists aren't just about the withholding of information to surprise viewers later. It's about how that information is, first of all, foreshadowed through peripheral detail throughout the show. And when we finally get that information, um, when the plot twist finally happens, it's supposed to make us you know, rethink all the plot threads that led to that moment. Um, and it's supposed mm -hmm. to kind of give us that feeling that we've learned something that's that's going to really affect the goals um, or the, the lives of our main characters. And this just doesn't really do it for me because it's like, what does the apocalypse even yeah. mean? And then I also think that the revelation of, um, you know, the, the Adela burst and and the fire and the powers that Shinra and Sho have they come from hell basically that you yeah. know Shinra and Sho can kind of like slip in and out of almost and that is like such an interesting supernatural revelation but the foreshadowing tries to happen in like visual things when like Shinra is like seeing the black flames or whatever mm -hmm. to me that's that doesn't give the viewers enough information to have been able to make that plot twist have a little bit more weight. So I think that on top of the fact that the evangelist is just a boring villain because I don't really get the motivations at all. Um, that's kind of what mm. really was the crux of why I didn't love the writing in the show. And it sucks that the evangelist is always portrayed as this like godlike figure that's always so in the distance. So it very much does feel like very inaccessible and if it's gonna be inaccessible to me as a viewer then I'm not gonna end up caring I'm sorry that's just the reality yeah. of how things work right mm -hmm. um all right and now let us approach the final few episodes right Shinra V show is the next Shinra V show <laughs> okay is the next little bit the final tumultuous battle between brothers mm -hmm. now I remember you were ahead of me a little bit in watching this and you sent me a Snapchat being like, <laughs> I cannot believe this. This uh, David Productions put all of their designing budget yeah. and animation budget into these two episodes. And I would say I have to agree. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. It looks amazing. I'm happy to see that like the brotherly emotional tension and trauma is finally being brought to light. It's very cathartic. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you really need in a final boss battle. The graphics animation are amazing. Uh, I particularly liked how at the very beginning when they're just starting their showdown, there's the dramatic effect of light versus dark. Mm -hmm. So you see the camera angle pan across the room. Um, and as you're panning, there are the shadows from the pillars that envelop them in darkness, followed by like an interim of light and then another shadow, mm -hmm. an interim of light. And it was it, it served to build up intensity very well. Right. So the visuals, amazing. 
music and sound effects, amazing. Very high intensity, very grating, um, very scary. And also the mysterious nature behind Sho and his abilities. Like we really don't know what he's all about. If he even knows what he's, if he even knows what he's all about, right? Yeah. If he, like what his abilities are. And so having Victor's presence there, someone who is acknowledged by others to be a scientific genius, so who is obviously very intellectual, um, being there and commentating on what he's seeing, but witnessing it in awe, it propels us to also be like, oh my gosh, like this must be very, <laughs> yes, very amazing, yeah. a very amazing sight to witness, right? Mm -hmm. What didn't work for me was, well, part of it was the actual science behind it. And then also like, like, obviously, it's very far-fetched to say, <laughs> I steal thermal energy from the universe yeah. to stop time. It's a little bit. I was like, hmm, you got to <laughs> think about that one again. Um, so, um, and then also, I couldn't shake the feeling that, like, show was so power, much more powerful in comparison to his brother towards the beginning of the battle. But you could see a lot of uh, Shinra's progression mm -hmm. being made throughout the battle yeah. <laughs> and I was like yeah of course you make him like learn everything in the very last battle he's like learning show. everything on the spot I was like mm, that's a little bit relatable that's like that's like <laughs> when I was in high school like taking like my freaking like oh my God. I would be taking like cal like my calculus. No, I didn't even do calculus. Advanced functions and like <laughs> yeah. all that kind of stuff. And I would be like teaching myself the concept like <laughs> while I was writing the unit test. Yeah. So uh, relatable. I was like, relatable. okay, like last boss battle and you learn all you got to learn. You do you. But the thing was, it was like at the beginning of the battle when Sho was so obviously dominant over his brother, but yet was like, okay, I'll give you all this time and space to learn <laughs> <laughs> instead of just beating you. Sure, like, yeah. Maybe this is just because I don't come from a science background. But the reason that, yeah. like, I am not even going to, like, put this on my list of critiques is because, like, things get ridiculous in anime. So, like, I mm -hmm. appreciate the effort that he put in to even try to take from scientific concepts. Um, and sure. not just make it like some random power that he's just going to invent. I is it ridiculous? Yes. Um, will I excuse it? <laughs> yes. Um, the other thing is like, yeah. Shut <laughs> up. <laughs> Show being more powerful, I agree. Like, it's it's like, why would he, if he really wants Shinra to get off his back, why wouldn't he just slice him up <laughs> and like just take him and like stop giving him this time to literally Do you learn remember when he was like standing on his back yeah and he like stabs him in the back yeah literally. i was like and he takes his sword out and all you see is a hole it's a black hole in his back he's yeah. not bleeding or anything i was like, I was like and then he gets up and like gets back into action i was like do you sir sir do yeah. you need to sit down <laughs> so yeah there's some suspension of disbelief that has to happen with this scene because it's like i don't believe that show would be this patient with him to let shinra literally learn on the spot yeah. <laughs> i don't have issues with shinra learning on the spot actually mm -hmm. i think it's like totally fine if like this for him is like even a training arc like whatever it's emotional <laughs> it's interesting what I did like about the fight, other than it being literally amazing and literally movie level production, was mm -hmm. I'm really, I guess I'm just really soft for these like sibling relationships. And right. I think, you know, maybe some people would find it melodramatic. I think it's okay because it was established that this was one of Shinra's goals pretty early on. But like just his kind of determination to really go like get through to his brother and to not give up and to really try his best to show show that like hey we were brothers <laughs> and like you know there was a time in our lives where like I was taking care of you and because show is very like insistent about like you know like I'm I'm not related to you whatever um but Shinra really over the course of the three episodes or whatever really come like breaks through to him and Sho sees these memories of him as a baby and of Shinra taking care of him and of their mother. And he kind of has this moment where he really wavers. And I was kind of happy to see that because I think it was sort of a moment where Sho, you're kind of reminded that like Sho is literally just this 12 year old kid. And this is kind of in line with the other themes in the show of like, 
of family and like the the mm. impact that family has on people and um how much the quest for Shinra to find his family again really shaped him and how the absence of family really shaped Sho. Um, I really like that he he wavers in this moment and I like that he doesn't also like completely convert and like join the fire force mm. like right away. Like he he retreats with the rest of the white clad, but with the implication that he has this new information. Um, so I think mm. it was like a good conclusion to the fight. All right. So now we will um, go into our conclusion. Right. Our last two episodes. Mm-hmm. So Shinra is stabbed. Haha. And he gets sent to the special ho- fire hospital. Yeah. And he wakes up and he encounters Captain Burns again, who comes to visit him. And Cap basically Burns reveals to him that he's actually known about Sho this whole time. But basically, uh, Shinra, after feeling a little bit better after the operation, he discovers that their childhood fire, which he believed uh, killed his mother and brother at first, um, actually it was started by Sho. And that the demon that he saw amidst the flames, who he mistook for a tertiary figure being there and for being the cause of the fire, was actually his mom yeah. in infernal form. Yeah. So... <laughs> I have issues with I'll, this. I don't yeah, know if you want to say anything <laughs> you go about first. it. Okay, well, I already sort of said my whole spiel about the issue with the plot twists in this show Mm. just in general and I think that this is another example of a plot twist that doesn't work because the details are a little convoluted because what we know about Infernals is that they come like people just spontaneously combust right Mm -hmm. and so if there was a demon a big demon Infernal in the house of that fire wouldn't a lot of people already assume that that would have been his what mom? makes you believe that (laughs) it's not your mom yeah like I it wasn't ever clear to me like what would make Shinra believe that it wasn't his mom mm. um and so he has this whole revelation of like that that infernal was my mom I'm like uh <laughs> <laughs> like you're telling me that no one told you hey that could have been your mom you're telling me that the only justification that I can yeah. find for this is like the infernal disappeared oh and yeah. they uh they placed a doppelganger of his mom's body sure yeah. So maybe that's the justification for that, but we know that Shinra saw the demon. So why wouldn't Shinra think that it I don't know. Anyways, so the setup for season 2 is he's going to try to find a way to like rescue his mom and turn her back into a human. That's fine, yeah. I guess. Um mm-hmm. again, I think just like the whole undercurrent of issues that I have with the whole evangelist movement in general or like Mm -hmm. because basically show starts the fire but I'm assuming that they had some kind of role in instigating that fire as well if I'm not Mm -hmm. mistaken so I I just don't know what the stakes are I think I agree my my issues lie with just the entire premise of trying to turn infernals back into humans because you literally went an entire series putting Infernals to rest and now you're trying to tell me just because it's your mom, even though you believe that everybody's lives should be saved, you just because it's your mom now, you think that it's po- possible to turn Infernals back into humans, then you're saying that you were okay with killing all of those Infernals right. the entire time. And it to me, it just feels like an undermining of all of this emotional work that was put into justifying killing infernals the entire season one i i agree and i also think i also think that maybe there are some lore reasons for what makes his mom like different but if they are then i think that they should definitely explore that because yeah i would also have that question like if this is something that's you would think that maybe people would want to explore that um like the scientists of this world you know we'll see i hope season two redeems itself a little bit okay so for our next segment we are going to be doing the bechdel test um for those of you that don't know the bechdel test is it was a test that was devised by 
in a cartoonist. I really need to look that up. She's a cartoonist <laughs> named Alison Bechdel. You, every episode, you're like, <laughs> she's a cartoonist. I she's a cartoonist. She's a cartoonist. Um, she is named <laughs> Alison Bechdel, and she developed a set of three questions that people can use to judge how good the female representation is in any particular mm-hmm. media. So the three questions are, are there at least two named female characters? Do they speak to each other? And do they speak to each other about something other than a male love interest? So that's the base okay. of the test. Let's talk. Yep. <laughs> I'm just salty. I'm, like, I, I actually, this is very difficult because the Bechdel test is a pass or fail. And based mm-hmm. on these three questions, um, they, it My passes. passes easily. However, <laughs> it's almost like, do we still want to pass it given the extremely overtly do we want to pass it in our hearts like no <laughs> etchy fan service yeah. element of the anime i don't know i don't know <laughs> let's talk about it first let's go through the characters mm-hmm. first i guess mm-hmm. so let's start with maki um she is the other than iris she's the only other girl at company yeah. eight she's not a lieutenant but she is above Shinra and Arthur. Actually, one of my favorite scenes in the show is like right at the start. It's probably like episode, I don't know, two or three. Shinra and Arthur have just joined the company and uh, Lieutenant Hinoa like asks them to spar with Maki and she like annihilates them. (laughs) She kind of like destroys them. And I really Mm -hmm. liked this for her character introduction um, because I, I think that she's genuinely like, I hope that she gets more fleshed out maybe later on in the show. Yeah, I think what we do know about her is that she is pretty like, um, she's pretty kind hearted, but she's also like pretty killer strong. And I do like that she consistently too. Yeah, consistently. And I do like when she fights with like Shinra and Arthur, like she does kind of beat them because Mm -hmm. you know, she has been a soldier longer. So it would make sense that, you know, she would kind of not even have any issues fighting them. I just think Maki is so cute. She is cute. Like I just I have no words. (laughs) (laughs) Like I I think she's probably my favorite female character in the entire series. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think it, the thing that just sticks out the most to me is like the duality with which her character is presented. Mm-hmm. Being very, very tough and very, very soft on the inside. Yeah, and I do like that. Isn't that just yes. like the idea of being very tough on the exterior mm-hmm. and soft on the interior mm-hmm. is a very common thing we see that being done with male characters yeah a very big reason why a lot of people like them so much and so it was refreshing to see that kind of trope being given to maki as a character too yeah because she's I agree. actually so girly but mm-hmm. that doesn't mean that she has to be physically very weak. yeah like her femininity i don't think is is really cut or undermined in any way even though she is like very capable like on the battlefield next let's talk about tamaki okay i think that we can all agree it's very problematic to show lucky lecher as like even being a thing Mm. Um, i can say that not only is her role as being the i don't even know what to call the fan service character (laughs) let's just put it in the best way Mm -hmm. not even um like her being fan servicey, uh, that's like not the main issue for me. It's that in combination with like she never gets redeemed really, and she's treated by others in mm. the in the a show as well to be just such a an object yeah. to be like kicked around, right? right? I I I'm not gonna like I'm not even lying when I say that somewhere throughout the show I was like. I can't stand this. I want to stop watching. Yeah. Like, it's not, it's unbearable to the level where it's like, I don't want to watch this show anymore because uh, thankfully towards the end of the show, it gets better because they like tone it down a little bit. Mm. But towards the beginning, I was like, this is such a turnoff for me from this show. Yeah. Like it's, I'm not about when I was watching through it, I like skipped through scenes. I skipped through certain <laughs> moments. Like I'm not even lying. I probably skipped through a lot of that, the wreck of fight. Like it was just, well, first of all, mm. I had already watched it, but also like, I just couldn't watch it. I didn't like it. Mm. Um, I think it's one thing to have someone like someone like Hibana have like 
have a character design that's like very you know cleavage showing um Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. she's an adult but maki is a minor and it just kind of goes back to the issue of over sexualizing literal children i'm not saying like even if it, even if she was an adult, I'm not saying it would be okay, but I'm saying it, I would stomach it a little bit better. But just the fact that she's a kid and, you know, I would maybe say in like 50% of her appearances, her clothes are coming off. And for like the dumbest reasons. And I don't know if that's something that people actually enjoy. Because like mm-hmm. you could flip it you could flip it. I'm not arguing this, but you could flip it that, hey, you know, girls watch shows like free for the same reasons. Right. I would right. say to okay. that, number one, I don't watch free for that reason. <laughs> um, but I would also say number two, you know, <laughs> people are are watching Haikyuu and zooming in on, on these boys' legs. They're also minors, you know? So mm-hmm. it's kind of like, mm-hmm you know, maybe some people actually do look at it like that. But I would also argue Mm. that it's so overt and so intentionally over-sexualized. Whereas in other shows, I mean, I can't speak to Free because I don't watch it. But, you know, in other shows, like, it's not overt like that. It's people using their imaginations to extrapolate. But in this show, it's like overtly, it's like in your... It's overtly to the point where I I watched a little bit of Free a while ago and mm-hmm. I don't ever remember somebody else's hands sliding under your pants. Right, right, right. Yeah. To, you it's know, a different like level. It's, yeah. it's a different level. <laughs> yeah. And I would also say like in the Rekka fight, when her clothes burn off, I was like, how come it's only her clothes burning off? For what? <laughs> like Shinra's clothes aren't burning off. Like I'm confused. <laughs> Let's talk about Iris. Sister Iris. I love Iris. Sorry. I love Iris too. I just love Iris. She's just cute. I I did have concerns about Iris at first, especially during the first episode, but I grew to love her over time because I realized that that's just who she is. Mm -hmm. And she wasn't meant to be a fighter. Yeah. She was always meant to be the the religious one sending the souls off with a prayer. Yeah. And she really consistently sticks to that role. And not only that, but she also contributes she contributes to the atmosphere of the company she's she's less confident than maki and then also she's more i would say like toned down yeah like introverted she's very right? demure um exactly yeah. so she has her own unique things to contribute especially because she is you know not a fighter at all like she's not a soldier she's a nun mm-hmm. um i think her role in the family and the company whatever is very like set there is a certain like tenderness to her character and even in the way Mm -hmm. that everyone interacts with her what she brings to the company is important in its own way so iris we love we love iris we'll adopt adopt her she's who we're adopting this episode (laughs) there's always gonna be at least one of them okay let's talk about lisa for a second dot 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 you talk about lisa okay i don't want to talk about lisa so lisa (laughs) i think the revelation of her actually being like one of giovanni's pawns i think that's fine um i think it was good for vulcan's character i okay this is something i just thought of just now (laughs) i am concerned that she won't get more depth to her because i think Mm -hmm. her being like a pawn in giovanni's plan to manipulate Vulcan my issue with that is having a female character that serves to just drive forward the plot of a male character maybe we'll actually go into who she is for a little bit but as of right now it's just kind of like she is kind of just there for Giovanni and for Vulcan the other issue that I have is there is something very predatory about the way that Lisa is being handled and manipulated by Giovanni both like visually and also just like the way that he's speaking to her and the way that he's kind of gaslighting her and because also like Lisa is also kind of more she's more scantily clad than the other members (laughs) of the evangelist movement like everyone else is like covered head to toe in masks and like everything and she has like this like dress with like that's like has like two pretty slits up the legs and it's like sleeveless i'm like what the heck 
It makes me th- like it reminds me of the scene with Tamaki and Rekka too. Yeah. I think that this anime presents to be honest, I haven't come to a conclusion yet about how I feel about it. Yeah. But this anime presents multiple scenarios that could be very realistically scenes of like domestic violence yeah and domestic abuse mm-hmm. because especially in the way that the male figure is always the male figure who is always the oppressive figure is very manipulative in both scenes mm-hmm. um so if you look at the scene with Rekka and Tamaki he's saying stuff like I had faith in you I thought you were going to be better than this yes yes, yes 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 kicking her into the ground and it's I don't know it's so deeply unsettling to me that I don't know how to feel about I think some people (laughs) being portrayed I think people might argue and say that Hibana in the way that she treats her subordinate men is That's also true. I was very. Say that too. It's also problematic. very problematic, and it like the way that when we see Hibana for the first time, she's like sitting, like her men, are, like she's sitting on her men, like like they're little mm-hmm. inanimate objects. That's just like equally as bad. That's equally as um, bad. Yeah. <sighs> deep sigh. <laughs> it, this is gonna be a hard one. I don't know what I'm gonna. I don't know. Does it pass? I'm gonna say it passes with. A big grain of salt with a lump of with salt. a lump of salt. That's the way to put it. Yeah, <laughs> because we can't. You know, there's no denying you got female characters. They have they're cute. You have great female characters. Yeah, and then you have terrible female characters. Yeah, and it's like I don't know. You know it. You know what really shocks me though is that the the protagonist of Soul Eater, Maka Alburn, is a fantastic mm. female protagonist For sure. at a time she was the protagonist of a shonen battle anime it, at a time when mm-hmm. there was really no female protagonist in a shonen battle anime and she mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. courageous she was like she was smart. she was smart she was cool you know she she was really great like she was a fantastic character and just yeah. to have the same mind <laughs> Right, Tamaki <laughs> and Lisa. I'm like really confused as to how I feel what? about that. Okay. Right. <laughs> Wait, we should explain. Dumpster fire is the part of the show. <laughs> Sorry, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Okay. Dumpster fire is the closing segment of our show. Uh, one of the closing segments of the show where we... Mm-hmm. <laughs> our brains have stopped working. We're just going to talk about Everything that we love, anything that we want, anything that we want. It's just unintelligible. We're just talk about whatever we want. It's just yeah. us putting our intellect away. The first opening of the season. <laughs> She's singing now. You're gonna get us copyrighted. Um, <laughs> Opening one, okay. what is it called? Inferno? Okay, it's called Inferno by Mrs. Green Apple. They are a J pop rock band, I guess. This is such a good song. I just want to mention that and shout it out because yeah. it wasn't even just a good opening. It was like, I loved this opening. Yeah. Okay, before we talk about some of our favorite characters, <laughs> I've got some fun facts. Oh, hit me with it. <laughs> we already established before we started this episode that Joker and Benny share um the same seiyus as some other favorite character of the favorite characters of ours yeah. in particular joker and overhaul from my hero Academia. which is from my hero aka mm-hmm. which is such a which came as a big surprise to me i heard it right away voice. i was surprised <laughs> yeah i it. didn't I'm sorry, I failed you, Tsuda Kenjiro. It's okay. And then Benny shares the same voice actor as So many people. Tamaki Sua from Oran High School Host Club. From Oran, which our is son. such a plot twist. <laughs> okay. All, All right. right. Do you have a favorite character from this anime? I I have picked one in my mind, but I have like a secondary yep. character that I also really like. But I will also just say mm. I like a lot of these characters. So you said you have two, but if I guess one, I win, right? Yeah. Please. You can win. <laughs> can you just tell me your feelings towards them? <laughs> I think I think they're cute. I th- I think they're cute. What the <laughs> heck? That's so big. All right, three guesses. <clears throat> Guess number one: Shinra Kusakabe. Oh, great guess, but no. Okay. Guess number two: um, Iris. 
Oh, great guess, but no. <laughs> what? Okay. What? My, I would say my favorite character as of right now because, you know, things are shifting is Arthur. Mm. No! Shut I would up. say I would also give you points. I would, I would also give you points for Benny and I would give you a half point mm. for Maki. Do you know who my favorite? Okay, guess mine. Okay, your favorite character? I am mm. going to guess. I feel like this is the safe guess. I'm not going to pull a fast one on you. I'm not smart enough I'm going to guess Benny. No! Frick. Is it Maki? Just because... No! no. <laughs> okay, I don't know. It's Arthur. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. I that's was, why I was, that's so... Why I was so shocked because we've never had the same favorite character. Before. I am honestly, for a second, right before I said Benny, I was like, it's going to be Arthur. Just because like her track <laughs> record shows, I was like, Noya, Tamaki Suo. I was like, okay, my, if I follow this train of thought, it's got to be Arthur. But then... I was like, I don't know. You seemed so excited about Benny mm, being Tamaki yeah. Suo. And then you also seemed very excited about the Asakusa arc. So I was like, she must like Benny. That brings us to the end of the dumpster fire segment. And now we'll go into our ratings for this show. Ooh. We were saying how it was going to be difficult to do the rating for this episode because there are... like. I think you can agree that we both have like a lot of conflicting feelings about yes. this show. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to rate Fire Force <clears throat> 3. 3.5 Ooh, okay. out of 5 sharp teeth. <laughs> <laughs> so I've chosen sharp teeth yeah. because it's part of um, Okubo's style. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I really like that. And I've chosen 3.5 out of 5 because... I wanted to say before I wanted that I wanted to give it like a 2.5 actually or a 3 mm-hmm. because factoring in just how amazing the style and the character designs and the animation are, that kind of warranted warranted the bump up to a 3.5. Mm-hmm. But I can't say I give it a 4 mm-hmm. because I think the over-sexualization of Maki, and uh, not Maki, sorry, of Tamaki is just too much for me to bear. Yeah. <laughs> and then also uh, some problems with pacing, some missed opportunities that would have been worthwhile to explore. And so that's why 3.5 from me. Mm, I am so conflicted. I'm also, <laughs> okay, here's my definitive answer. Oh, this is so hard. I'm going to rate it also 3.5 out of 5 <gasps> yeah i was okay i'll rate it 3.5 out of 5 excaliburs so i <laughs> it was very this hurts to say because i think if i were to really zoom out i would say that my heart wants to give it a 4 <laughs> out of 5 just because yeah it really is, on a surface level, just a good shonen anime. And if you are asking me for recommendations on shonen anime, I would recommend Fire Force. But I do have to bump it down because the writing just isn't there. And if I were to think about the writing, there isn't enough that I love for me to like give it a definitive four. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. I got to say... 3.5 but I really do like it <laughs> I would still recommend it to I would other still people. recommend it to people with like a grain of salt okay that brings us to the end of our episode officially Woo. thank you everybody for listening if you made it we know far. it was difficult but please um, keep following us on twitter at into the workshop on youtube subscribe we are at the workshop as well as on spotify and now we're on Apple Podcasts as well. Yay! You can search us up by our name, The Workshop. And we're looking forward to seeing you guys next time. We've got a special We've got special a good one up. for the next We've episode. got a good one next, next episode. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks so much. Bye! Bye.